the other day, I was in Paris, Gare du Nord, queuing to buy a ticket for the metro. I had the choice between machines and humans. I chose the humans. Approaching the teller, I discovered this sticker. Good morning makes good mornings. And I thought, why the hell do I need to be reminded that I am in front of a human and not in front of a machine? What is broken in how we think about humans? It all starts by acknowledging that words matter. Like a magnet which generates a field around it, words generate a semantic field. This semantic field conditions the effect of the words. And human is a word. So what is the semantic field around it? And why is it broken? Aristotle suggested that humans are beings with logos. Logos can be understood as language or reason. If it is about language, my GPS is human. If it is about reason, IBM's Watson is human. We all agree that neither talking devices nor computers deserve to be granted human status. So, logos as a distinct criteria for humanness does not work anymore. We need a new proxy for humanness. The modern version of logos is rationality. It is one of the heavy legacies of modern times to consider humans as rational subjects. The rational subject is driven by an omniscience, omnipotence utopia. There is no limit to what the rational subject can achieve, provided he gets the knowledge and the means. Like Archimedes, who thought that he could lift the earth, provided he had a lever. The freedom of the rational subject is about autonomy, disconnection, control. It stops only where that of others begins. Or in French, sa liberté s'arrête là où commence celle des autres. In other words, the rational subject would be freer if he were alone. His freedom is like a truncated divine freedom. There is another version of the rational subject, that of a compliant being who follows procedures. This is the lower version of the rational subject. Both versions share the fact that each is alone and that it is all about control, either to be in control for the upper version or to be under control for the lower version. And the rational subject never knows on which side he stands. With the puppeteer and Archimedes, or with the puppet and the compliant being. He is haunted by this perpetual doubt. If you permit, I have a few things to say to Descartes. René. If you hear me, please give me a ring. <laughs> Hi, this is Nicole. I, I am calling you from the 21st century, 2016 to be precise, a few time zones away. Hi, Nicole. <laughs> I wanted to let you know that weird things are happening down here. Tell me about it. You remember you were puzzled by the fact that men 
might be fooled by an evil genius? Yes, indeed. Well, let me tell you. Men are very good at fooling themselves. No need for an evil genius. How is that? They make computers and robots to replace and even mimic themselves. Don't ask me why. Perhaps they fool themselves just to put an end to wandering. It must be that they hate doubt or uncertainty even more than being fooled. You know, when you were around, there were not so many artifacts. Now, we are surrounded by them. They speak to us, they call for attention. When we want, they, we, we are flooded with information and bombarded by notifications of all kinds. When we want to speak to a human, we have to go through call centers and their endless option trees. We even have to demonstrate to machines that we are human to interact with them. Frankly, René, your rational subject does not help us much anymore. We need a new proxy for humanness. I see, but are you sure? Yes. Your rational subject was immensely useful in order to distinguish men from nature. By the way, it was not so useful for women, but I'll call you later on that one. So back to our business. Your rational subject does not help us to grasp humanness anymore. Instead, it powers the blurring of the distinction between humans and artifacts. I hope you won't mind if we move on. Okay, I get it. <sighs> thanks, René, thanks. Speak to you soon about women. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, with gratitude to her, let me now introduce Hannah Arendt. She is also a major philosopher and political thinker. She paves the way for the new proxy for humanness we are looking for. Are you ready? Yes. Thank you. So let's say thank you to the rational subject for what it has delivered. And goodbye. Let's now welcome the relational self. For Arendt, plurality, not rationality, is at the heart of the human condition. Plurality is a precise concept. It is not just many or diversity. It is made up of three components. Please follow. First, equality. We are all human. Second, uniqueness. We are a who, not a what. And this who is unique. With Arendt, we embrace equality and uniqueness in one go. We are equal because we are unique. Third, relationality. In the past, human relationality has been seen as a threat to individual freedom. Hence, we emphasized autonomy. However, human identity is not this thing that I own and control. To reveal who I am to myself, I need to speak and be heard by other humans. So, human identity has a revelatory character, most importantly for myself. So, relationality is neither a threat nor a nice to have. It is the exclusive path to our identity. This is what was missing in Descartes' rational subject. It is what is broken in how we think about humans. 
And it is precisely in a world of exploding material connectivity, internet, smartphones, sensors, that we must embrace the inherent plurality of the human condition. This plurality is the true path to our authentic sense of identity, freedom, and purpose. Plurality made up of equality, uniqueness, and relationality allows us to distinguish humans from artifacts. I would ask you all to consider changing your personal proxy for humanness from rational subject to relational selves. With the relational self and the foregrounding of plurality over rationality that it entails, we have the vital tool to fix what is broken in how we think about humans. Control remains important for the relational self. There is indeed a need to be in control of our tools. But that need for control does not expand endlessly to all humans and to the world, as it did for the rational subject. From humans and in the world, relational selves seek something other than control. From humans, the relational self seeks recognition. Remember, humans cannot access their own identity without this recognition from other humans. This is why being deprived of recognition or being humiliated is a form of political exclusion. In the world, Relational selves seek to orient themselves. We navigate in the world rather than controlling it. And contrary to the rational subject for whom freedom was about autonomy and control, the freedom of the relational self relies on a proper balance between control, orientation and recognition. You remember the rational subject and its haunting perpetual doubt about whether he's a puppeteer or the puppet? Well, the relational self is instead simply vulnerable. Vulnerability is not for victims only, nor just for women. Men, even the ones deemed most powerful, are also vulnerable. They know it, even if some try hard to hide from it. No vulnerability, no humanness, and no freedom. So, as relational selves, let's acknowledge and embrace our vulnerability. In this hyper-connected era, a new form of vulnerability comes into play, and this will be my conclusion. The vulnerability of our attentional spheres. We should take care. There is a risk of our attention being cannibalized by automated systems. Why call them smart, by the way? Our attentional spheres require protection. They may even deserve a new fundamental right in order to ensure our integrity. As we are all, I hope you are convinced by now, relational selves. Thank you. <laughs>